My name is Janice Stewart, and we're so glad to have you with us today. We completed lesson three of We Are Partakers of His Divine Nature our last time together. We invite you to go to our YouTube page that you see there on the screen so that you can view, view the complete teaching of lesson three. Today, we will continue in our lesson, We Are Partakers of His Divine Nature. Our study text during the course of the teachings that we have done, we have begun, is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. But before we begin, let us pray. Avinu Malkinu, our Father and King, we exalt you. We proclaim that you are the King of the Jews. You are the Lord of the nations. You are exalted above every principality, every power, and every dominion. We invite you, Ruach HaKodesh, into our presence today. We know that you're here but we want to acknowledge that we invite you in, we welcome you, because we remind ourselves in Yachanan that you taught us on Yachanan 16 that you sent the Ruach HaKodesh uh, to lead and guide us into all truth. And so we thank you that you will lead and guide us as we uh, study your word. We pray that your word will be engrafted upon our very souls so that we may be transformed into the image of Yeshua HaMashiach, your dear son. In Yeshua's name we pray, Amen.
As an introduction into lesson four, let's review what we learned about the list of places mentioned in Acts 2 verses 9 through 11. Silverman explains that the list of places mentioned in Luke Acts chapter 2, 9 through 11 represent a microcosm of Jewish people from the four corners of the earth during the second temple period in Jewish history. These were Jewish people hearing the message of Yeshua in Yerushalayim on Shaviot. And this is the end of his commentary notes that we discussed. This is a great segue into today's lesson as we look at the commentary notes on 1 Peter and 2 Peter from Daniel B. Wallace and his commentary on 1 and 2 Peter. So that's where we will be today. We're going to segue into looking at these commentary notes and, and see the re relevance of what we've learned prior to today as we move forward in today's lesson. By looking at the English translation of the text of 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 in the ESV translation and the OJB, which is the Orthodox Jewish Brit Kaddishah New Covenant translated by Dr. Philip Goebel. Um, that translation is a Hebrew version of the New Testament, the Brit Kaddishah books. It uh, presents a messianic account of the life and times of Yehoshua, Yeshua, uh, and his disciples with vocabulary that is consistent with present day Jewish orthodoxy. So here on the screen, we're just reviewing what we read last time of the ESV translation of Petro, Epistole, Prote, Peter Epistle First, First Epistle of Peter. Um, in the ESV, and it read, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. That was the ESV translation. Screen, which we looked at in our last lesson, is the translation from the Orthodox Jewish Bible, the OJB, which is the Orthodox Jewish Brit Kaddishah New Covenant that we re-read re in our last lesson of Petro Epistole Prote, First Peter, Epistle of First Peter. Shimon Kiva Ashiliach of Rebbe, Melech Hamoshiach. Yehoshua, Yeshua, has references there that you could go reference, Zechariah 6, 11 through 12, Ezra 3, 8, to the Habakarim, the chosen ones, Two, four, six, and nine, to the exiled ones of the Golis sojourners living as aliens in the diaspora scattered in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And that is the OJB. You can visit the website that you see there on the screen to get a really great, rich understanding of the OJB. So we invite you to visit that website. At 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 in the Greek. Petro Epistole Prote, Peter Epistle First. We know that the Brit Kadesha, the New Testament, New Covenant, is written in Greek, and so we definitely wanted to look at it in its original language. We have it here on the screen. Petros Apostolos Jesu Christo Ecletois Para Pedemos Diasporas Ponto Galasias Capodokias Asias Kai 
Bithy nice. And so we've read it in the Greek there because we wanted to see what the original language said because we looked at it in the English and we looked at it, looked at it in the OJB. And when we did look at it, you notice we have a couple of the words there uh, highlighted in red. We learned that the noun diasporas and the adjective part of it almost that we saw in red and you see that on the screen there in the verse um, of verse one of first Peter were very important words in helping us to understand who the audience of first Peter were in the text. We learned that both the ESV and the OJB English translations were consistent with the original Greek of the verse. And I encourage you to hear this in its entirety so that it makes more sense to you. Uh, we invite you to go to our web, I'm sorry, our YouTube page that you see there on the screen. And this will help you to kind of get more of a clear understanding of what we did discuss in its entirety in lesson, um, in our previous lesson. So that brings us to our lesson for today. Review before we begin our lesson today. Hopefully that that helped you to understand what we did discuss last time. And so as we mentioned last time, we will be looking at the relationship between 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 and 2 Peter 3.1's description of the audience of the epistles in this lesson. So we begin by sharing some commentary notes from Daniel B. Wallace. Um, and we want to look at his commentary notes. Just wanted to remind you that we're still looking at the diaspora visitors to Yerushalayim at Shaviot. You see those places there on the map that is on the screen. And we still have there for you the um, Original Greek translation, Petro Epistolae Prote, Peter Epistle First. And so we're looking now, uh, continuing our study into understanding who the audience was of First and Second Peter, because that's going to make a big difference in helping us, especially as Gentiles, to understand how we have been grafting, grafted in as partakers of his divine nature. Because some of you may be wondering, why is she talking about all of this when the um, subject of or the topical study of this lesson is we are partakers of his divine nature. So stick with this. It will make sense. Um, we know we're looking at the, the verse 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4. But as we've discussed in our prior lessons, it is very important and imperative that we understand the background and the Jewish essence of the scriptures especially for us Gentiles to understand how we are grafted in to the promises that we read in the Brit Kaddishah. Okay, so we're going to take a look now at Daniel B. Wallace's commentary um, here as we move forward. At Daniel B. Wallace, um, his commentary on who the audience of the writing of the epistle of First Peter uh, was as we look at his argument first Peter introduction argument and outline series the following he states and you have it there on the screen that Peter means the geographical rather than the political districts in the term Pontus Galatia Cappadocia Asia and Bithynia is evident from the fact that Pontus and Bithynia were one province politically, but were separate areas geographically. Thus, he is addressing Christians in a more restricted area than the political terms would mean. As well, he states, these are regions which Paul had barely penetrated. And he makes a reference um, in his 
his uh, argument in Acts 16, 6 through 7. He says, though there can be little doubt that his converse, speaking of Shaul, Paul, that his converse from adjacent regions were responsible for bringing the gospel north. Now, what I'd like to do, I'm ending his quote, is we want to look at a couple of points here. Uh, the first thing that I want to say is that uh, Daniel B. Wallace is approaching the question of who the epistle was addressed to by explaining the places named in 1 Peter, Petro 1, 1, by um, approaching it from their geographical significance versus their political significance, which according to Wallace means that the writer of First Petro was addressing and said, I'm going to say these words. You notice in his quote, he said Christians, but I want to share something with you. I'm going to address it this way, addressing God's community of Messiah followers. The reason I changed it for me, and this is, wasn't his quote, is that we must understand that when you see the English translation of the word church or Christians, we want to make sure that we um, use more of the word God's community of Messiah followers, which in, is inclusive of the Jewish uh, Messiah followers who heard the message at Shaviot. We know the scriptures also teaches us that the gospel is preached to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles, but it's inclusive of the Jewish Messianic followers at Shaviot who heard the good news of the gospel and embraced Yeshua as their promised king um, in the Torah, in the Tanakh. Um, so, but he's saying here that it was a restricted area that we're looking at here in this uh, reference. Number two, we do want to go and look at the reference he did uh, make reference to, which is Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 7. And if you have your Bible, I encourage you to get your Bible and let's look at this together um, because it is significant that we look at the text. So as we look at Acts 16, verse 6 through 7, it reads, And they went through the region of Fiji and Galatia, having been forbidden by the royal Kakodesh, the Holy Spirit, to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the royal Kakodesh, the spirit of Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, did not allow them. Did not allow them. Remember he said that Shaul had not penetrated these areas. And that is very important that we remember this because we want to look at the um, narrative in the text in Acts chapters 1 up to this point and realize that until we get to Acts chapter 10, which we'll make reference here, is that the Gentile inclusion has not progressively begun to happen yet. Yet, the writer Luke, in Luke Acts, is making that progression as we look at the book of Acts and see the progression and the narrative progression to let us, the reader, see that. So the question is, what does this tell us? Remember that we learned in our previous lessons on Luke Acts chapter 2 and lesson 3 that on the day of Shaviot, the promise of Yoel 2 was realized by the Jews and devout men in Yerushalayim. They were hearing the good news and embracing Yeshua, their Messiah, who was promised to them, promised to Israel in the Tanakh, which we call the, some people say the Old Testament or Old Covenant. It is actually the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. At this point in the historical narrative of Luke Acts, Shaul had not begun his missionary journey to the Gentiles. Now, we can read about Shaul's missionary journeys. Uh, his first journey is recorded in Acts 13. 
Another reference that we can look at is Eric Chabot, who's an apologist, and he's um, with Ratio Christie. He ministers here at the Ohio, the Ohio State University. I always have to make sure I say that uh, here um, to the students as an apologist. Um, and he's the author of many, many books. You can find a lot of his teachings on YouTube or you can visit his website as well. Uh, he's with uh, Rachel Christie or you could you could Google Think Apologetics, sorry, Think Apologetics Eric Chabot, C-H-A-B-O-T. And he has a teaching on YouTube called The Historical Reliability of the Book of Acts. In his teaching, he says, it is with the book of Luke Acts that we see the beginning of a new community of Jews and Gentiles that are one in Messiah, beginning in Acts 10, reading about Cornelius. Here we begin to see Jews and Gentiles um, together accepting the Jewish Messiah and worshiping in a sacred place the synagogue. When you see the English translation of the Greek word ekklesia, which um, ekklesia, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word ka'al or kehila, it means it will always mean the assembly, the community of God. I think it's very important that we know that so that we can remember that we are one in Messiah and that there's there is one community, Jew and Gentile, worshiping together in a sacred place. And then we all know that as Shaul began his missionary journeys, then we had kind of the separation, which is a different subject for a different time. So uh, so what have we learned? Uh, I would say that we've learned from Wallace's commentary notes uh, that Shaul had not visited the places that we see on our map here on the screen. Uh, mentioned in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, uh, the same places that remember we uh, saw that were mentioned in Acts 2. We remember, let's keep in our, in our memory that the audience or addressees were Jews and devout men from the known world at that time who had not uh, who had come, I'm sorry, into Jerusalem for Shaviot. What can we learn from uh, Eric Shabot's teaching? From Eric's, we can see Luke progressively moving the historical narrative to now include the Gentiles into the assembly of God, Jews and Gentiles together, accepting the Jewish Messiah. That is very important for us, as we move into our topical teaching, we are partakers of his divine nature. Five of we are partakers of his divine nature and our discussion of the scholarly views of on the ethnic mix of the audience of the Messiah followers being written in the first epistle of Peter. Again, we thank you for being with us today. We look forward to you joining us um, for our next lesson. And hopefully in, you, you learn as much as I learned. I just, I, it is so exciting uh, when we're spending time together in the word of God. So it is my prayer that you're learning as much as I am. We're always delighted to have you with us. And we just thank you for spending time with us around the word of God. So let's end our lesson in prayer. Um, and again, we invite you to visit our YouTube page, Life in the Vine Ministries with Janice Stewart. Feel free to email us if you have any questions or if you would like more information on how to begin your process of embracing Yeshua and learning about him and his kingdom. Email us. We have lots of resources for you. We can make sure that you're connected and that you can begin your journey on a sure-footed foundation of the essence of our faith in Yeshua HaMashiach, the King of Israel's 
the Lord of the nations, the God of the nations. So we just praise and thank you for that. Avino Malkano, our Father and King, we praise and thank you for the opportunity that we had to be with you and to gather around your word. We pray, Lord, that this word will be um, fall on good soil, Lord, and that great fruit will be produced from it. We do live of those who are embracing you or have a desire to know about who you are and that they want to embrace you, Yeshua, and uh, come into the kingdom of God through Yeshua HaMashiach. We pray that you will draw them in by the Royal HaKodesh and that you will reveal yourself to them. And so we just praise and thank you. We give you all the glory and we thank you for your word, Lord, and for sending Yeshua to us here uh, that we may come into your kingdom, uh, into the space where you are. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We get to see you next time. Uh, and we just say, have a blessed week. Uh, and may the grace and mercy of our dear Lord continually be with you and your family. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. See you next time.